Thank you all for coming to our first lecture on sustaining the earth. Um, Provost Hoffman is going to introduce our guest of honor. Uh, but first, I have a little um, gratitude to express our programming series co-sponsors. It's, it's a, you might want to, you know, take a breath because this is a long list and it's alphabetical so we don't mean to slight anybody. The American Intercultural Studies Program, the Ames Historical Society, the Ames Public Library and the Bioethics Program, the Bernier Art Museum, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Committee on Lectures funded by GSB, the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, the Department of Geologic and Atmospheric Sciences, the Department of Horticulture, the Department of Natural Resources, Ecology and Management, the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, uh, Educational Leadership and Policy Studies, Graduate Program on Sustainability, the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication, the Institute of Science and Society, the ISU Council on Sustainability, the Iowa State University Extension to Families, and the F. Wendell Miller Lecture Fund from our College of Arts and Sciences, the Leopold Center, Ryman Gardens, and a major grant from the Humanities Iowa. I'm now going to turn the podium over to Provost Betsy Hoffman, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Joe, and uh, congratulations on your first year as uh, director of the center. It looks like a very, very exciting program. Um, and how appropriate to have uh, Scott Peters kick off this uh, programming series on sustaining the earth. He comes to us from a sister land-grant institution, Cornell University, and he's focused on land and agriculture. He points out the centrality of food in human history. For all of mankind's existence, agriculture has been the basis for civilization. But his vision is more encompassing and more nuanced. He argues that the university's work includes more than increasing productivity from the land, through scientific and technical progress. Such productivity and progress are important, of course, but the story is much bigger, or ought to be. If you look at his credentials, you will see that he specializes in agricultural education and extension. So what does that have to do with the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities? For Professor Peters, the university, especially the land-grant university, has a contribution to make to sustaining the environment, culture, and vibrant political life. His view of the relationship between academia and society includes social values, ethics, and community, concerns of the humanities. Agriculture for him includes culture. But he analyzes the mission of the university in terms of narrative, the art of storytelling, Professor Peters is sensitive to the power of narrative to frame the function of our land-grant universities and their connections to the larger community. This is why he deconstructs various narratives into the heroic, tragic, and prophetic, depending on who is telling the story and how it is received. I'm happy to say that here at Iowa State, the prophetic narrative is beginning to be told as well as to be heard. With the support of our administration, faculty are engaging communities, not just talking to our citizens, but soliciting their active participation to work with them. The Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities hopes that new ideas for public participation will emerge as we proceed through our series about sustaining the earth energized by speakers like Scott Peters. He has published in agricultural history, environmental ethics, and public engagement. His next book is entitled, Critic and Leader as Well as Servant, Higher Education's Roles in the Public Work of Democracy. How fitting for a land-grant university. It will contribute to an emerging debate about the nature and significance of American higher education's public purposes and work. He is also active as associate editor for the Journal of Higher Education Outreach and Engagement 
editing the practice stories from the field section. I think it's fair to say that Scott Peters has found or heard his calling. It includes calling us to reorient the university more firmly in public life. For only then can we further the ideals that Professor Peters found central to the American project, sustainability and liberty. The university should be a main character in the narrative of communal life, promoting productivity, increasing scientific expertise, and sustaining a free and creative public. Please join me in welcoming Professor Scott Peters to our university and our program series. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I have never been to Iowa State University before, so this is my first visit. I was supposed to come a year and a half ago, but my plane got canceled. And by the time I, they could have rebooked me to get here, I would have missed the whole conference I was going to, coming from, coming to, to be a part of. I mentioned this afternoon to a few people that my perspective of higher education's role in society has shifted rather dramatically recently um, because of something that's built into my home. My wife is a state legislator. I met her two days after 9-11, and we married a year later. And uh, actually, when I met her, she informed me that she was going to run for the state legislature, and, and would that be a problem? Um, I think she was thinking already we were going to have a relationship. Anyway, she, did get elect she didn't get elected the first time she ran, but she did get elected in uh, 2004. And she serves on the Higher Education Committee. And suddenly, I started thinking about what it must look like from a legislator's perspective when they're deciding whether or not to give public tax dollars to universities. Uh, and I hadn't really thought about it from that perspective before. What, is, what are they thinking they're getting when they give universities like Cornell or like Iowa State University some of the public's money? So we've had some good conversations about this, and I have my own hopes <laughs> about, about that conversation, and I don't know what I'm sure you know about what those conversations are like when, when you have them <laughs> in uh, Des Moines here or in Albany in, in, in New York. But I come out of what I've learned so far with her feeling more hopeful rather than less, even in the face of the loss of public funding. Um, and that's because I've come to humanize <laughs> the legislators, which before had been this category of abstract people, and usually you're upset about politicians. That's where the way we are in this culture, but uh, as I've come to meet a lot of her colleagues and, and uh, like them very much, I realize these are really wonderful human beings. They care about a whole bunch of things, and um, we can have a conversation with them about the things we, we want to do in higher education and the things we care about. So that's just a little aside about where I'm coming from. I think in, I'm thinking a lot these days in, in relation to the topic of sustaining the earth and public scholarship in the arts and humanities, I'm thinking a lot in term of, I'm thinking a lot about the question, what should we do? And I'm thinking about that in the context of myself as a scholar, as an academic professional, uh, someone who works at a, at a land-grant university. Cornell is the land-grant university for New York State. It's also a private endowed Ivy League institution. And if you think the culture at this institution is tricky, try going to a place like that and talk about institutional identity. So I've been thinking a lot about this question in the face of the challenge of pursuing sustainability and the face of the challenge of living out um, the purposes that we have in higher education. What should we do? And in this, this context, I have a, the voice of one of my most important mentors in my head. His name is John Forrester. He's a professor of city and regional planning at Cornell. And one phrase that he wrote um, that I, has stuck with me, uh, because it's somewhat counterintuitive in the academic world, is uh, practice before theory. 
which is a, a kind of a mantra that, that some of his colleagues and, and he have that jars us in the academic community, jars me in the academic community to want to be connected to communities and not just be theorizing. <laughs> to want my theory and my academic work to be drawing from the experiences and, and stories of people in communities, including academic professionals. So in the context of my work, uh, which is much based on both history and oral history of people who are still alive and, and their work, I came across this passage from Alastair McIntyre, who's a philosopher. This is from his book called After Virtue. McIntyre has written, I can only answer the question, what am I to do? If I can answer the prior question, of what story or stories do I find myself a part? We enter human society, that is, with one or more imputed characters, roles into which we have been drafted. And we have to learn what they are in order to be able to understand how others respond to us and how our responses to them are apt to be construed. What I want to do here tonight is to begin, is to remember the mantra I've been taught and begin to put practice before theory and to start with a story. And this is from an oral history of one of my colleagues, uh, a woman I find uh, to be wonderfully impressive, a woman of great integrity and, and passion. And she's a faculty member in the Department of Horticulture at Cornell. Her name is Marsha Eames Shevely. And her area is, uh, program area is something that she refers to as garden-based learning. I want to start with her story and lay that out and then try to make some meaning of that story in the context of the theme of this semester-long series of sustaining the earth through public scholarship in the arts and humanities. Now, I want to say before I start that I'm well aware that the story I'm going to tell you is very, very, very small. And I'm well aware <laughs> that the problems of global warming and you know what we've been hearing about what's happening in Wall Street and my state are big problems. And so the story is going to look really, really small up against that. And I guess that's one of the reasons why I want to tell it. Because in the face of this really, really big stuff, I think we're missing the small stuff. And I'm pretty sure that that we can't afford to miss the small stuff. So let me tell you her story. First, let me say that the, I have engaged my students uh, in a process of gathering stories from the field. The, the, the part of the journal that was mentioned, uh, uh, practice stories from the field, is, is part of the scholarship of working in, in the area of narrative inquiry. So. What we have done is we have found people who are academic professionals who are deeply engaged in communities and we've invited them to tell us their stories of their experience of working in communities. But not only their experience of working in communities and what they're doing, but also getting something of their life story. Um, what led them to want to be an engaged public scholar? Uh, working in particular because I do care very deeply about agriculture and. Um, food and, and all the connections that come with that, um, particularly people who are working in areas that do have something to do with agriculture and, and the food system and the environment. So Marsha's story um, is one of the ones we've gathered. It's one of the ones that's going to be included in this, this new book that's going to come out in early 2010 from Michigan State University Press. So without any more apology, let me just read you some of her story. And these are long interviews that are produce uh, pretty lengthy profiles. The, just one more thing about the context here. If any of you know Studs Terkel, he's a sort of popularizer of oral histories. This is kind of in that vein. We do in-depth interviews. They're transcribed. They're edited. The only thing that's left is the voice of the person speaking. They're telling their story, talking about their experience in the first person. The interviewer's voice is not there. The interview, of course, shapes the story because we ask questions. It's a participatory, collaborative process to create these stories. So what I'm reading you come are excerpts from this. So at the beginning of these interviews, we, we asked people, 
what they're committed to, what they're passionate about, and then we ask them how they got that, um, came to have that, and usually that involves asking them things like, where'd you grow up? And what was that like? And, and did you have any important mentors or experiences? Because we think that understanding the practices and experiences of engaged scholars can't be done with bullet points and with simple recipe pieces. We have to understand the person. And usually this plays out well because we do find that there's something in the person's life story that has led them to where they are to be doing what they're doing. And somewhat surprisingly for those of us who are professors in this area, we find that uh, most of the things they know how to do, they didn't learn from a book from some guy with a PhD. <laughs> Oftentimes they learned it from their mother or their father when they were growing up because we're talking about civic engagement here. So here's Marsha talking about what she's committed to. What gets me excited is not so much plants, but plants as an avenue through which we can create human, community well and com human and community well-being. I mean, that just really thrills me. It's accessible, it's inexpensive, it's time-honored. It's amazing the change that plants and gardens can make in a community and in an individual's life. So that's what gets me going. It's not just the plants, but how they have an impact on us on a number of levels. In terms of the kinds of impacts that plants and gardens have on us, have on us often we think about food. For example, in this department, we think about healthy food. Or we'll talk about the act of growing plants as being healthy for us. And I think that's important. But I th that it's just so much more. Plants have an impact on our well-being just by the virtue of their being beautiful. Sometimes I think we're almost embarrassed about that as a community of horticulturalists. That's kind of a fluffy thing. I don't think it is. I think it's huge. We need now more than ever beauty in our lives and plants can provide that. More and more, I think people are concerned about the disconnect that people have from nature and their surroundings. And the garden can be an avenue through which we reconnect. So we can hear some things. You could feel the passion in her voice if you could hear it from this, from Marsha, about what she's up to and what she's committed to. And one of the interesting things about her, and the important things about her that we need to understand to know someone like her, is that this is not something she learned about in a book. She's learned about it by doing it. So here's a story. She was invited to tell us a story about doing this kind of work. So this is the story. This is parts of the story that she told. So the story she told us was a story about a small elementary school in a little town called Freeville, which is a real town. This is not a pseudonym. It's a real town that's very close to Ithaca. She was invited to be on what's called a um, site-based management team for this school. That's something that the New York State education system has. And so she joined the site-based management tool. And this is part of a process of the state education department has to try to get parents and others more involved in, in their children's schools to get the process uh, more participatory, basically. So she, she was on this process. So Marcia says, this is a school that has had some difficulty. From my perspective, many of the teachers seem sort of frustrated and even outright demoralized. It was at a difficult point in this school's life. We were talking about what would be a project that we could engage in that would rally people around something we could feel good about and do and feel a sense of accomplishment. It seemed to me that a garden might be a really wonderful way to go. I'm real surprised that it seems to her that a garden would be a wonderful way to go. So I threw it out to the committee. What do you think about this idea? The idea is a very small, manageable school garden for students in grades K through 4 that would pull this school community together and connect to the curriculum. So it wasn't just an exercise in creating a garden. What we did first was we batted the idea around. What do you think about a garden, I asked. And people said, it makes a lot of sense. We have a lot of room. We don't have anything like that. It could offer experiential learning for our students. We can do this. It's manageable. We'll do something really small, and we'll do well at it. So as Marcia started to tell the story, an important part of this story that she emphasizes was her intentional effort to make this project a we project, not an I project. These interviews, I should mention, that we're doing are pushing something hard intentionally, and that is to get people to use the word I. We're trying to find out 
practitioners, we're trying to learn about what practitioners do in experience, scholars and extension educators who are out in communities. And so we're really pushing to, to find out what did they do? What was their role in the work? And in this story, Marsha pushed real back, hard back at us. She didn't want to use the word I. And it's because of what she understood her project to be. So you'll hear a bit of that in the rest of this. So Marsha said, in a community-based project, we, you want it to be a we. And at the same time that I was initiating this and moving it forward, it was very important that I be a we. What I did was bring up the idea and suggest a process. So I organized this whole effort. But I kept pulling in people at various points along the way to own it, to move it forward in their own fashion. Marsha also told us that she had to deliberately slow the process down. Fred, you were talking about efficiency this afternoon. Marsha says, this might not sound earth shattering, but often people will do a community-based project and they'll just do it. I spent a year not doing it, trying to think of everybody that needed to know about it and needed to be involved. With this kind of a project, it's almost like we think in terms of efficiency. But for this type of job, I think of making it as inefficient as possible because I want to pull in so many people. It's almost like a backward way of thinking. If there's a straight line from me to the garden, I want to think of all the different people that I can pull in first. It may make, a little bit, make it a little bit unwieldy at first, but it's a way of making sure everyone is involved. What often happens is people get excited about the idea of a garden and they get out the rototiller. But this committee took a year to plan it before, it before ever digging up the ground. We talked about our approach, we planned what kind of a garden we wanted, and we met with each grade level to see what kind of theme might work with what, st what the students were learning. So we were very thoughtful about the process. We spoke with the principal, the custodian, with parents, with the groundskeeper. We talked to everyone we could possibly have an opinion about this before moving forward. I remember it was from September to April that we, were sp we spent planning all the facets of the garden. I wasn't so much wrapped up with what, the, what, with what the plants were that were going to go into it, she's a horticultural expert, as I was wanting it to be really, really well organized. I was more at the helm with the who part. I was asking, who are we going to involve? Who will be doing the maintenance for this? Who needs to know about it? How do we get people excited about it? How do we guarantee that people are going to care for this, that it won't be vandalized, that people are going to own it? How do we create excitement among the students? To the committee, I said, you know, we could easily do this ourselves. We could do this ourselves. We could go out on a Saturday morning. The garden is small. We could do it easily. But let's think of how to be as inefficient as we possibly can. How can we involve so many people with this that people will feel that it's their garden? So Marcia says, we sent a note home to every child in the primary school and the elementary school saying that we're having a big bed building and we want everybody there. We invited all the children. I remember asking the McDonald's and the Dunkin' Donuts to contribute food. I sent a notice to the police department and the fire department letting them know we were doing this and please join us. I think I even sent a note to all the service groups, the Rotary. Imagine taking the simple garden and making it into a three-ring circus. We wanted everyone in town there. So Marcia then tells us about the bed building day. On a rainy Saturday morning in April, of course it was raining, we made the garden. 120 people showed up in the rain, tons of children. The school principal was there, the groundskeeper. What we did was we mixed the soil and compost in the parking lot and a couple hundred yards away we had people building the beds. And so we built the beds, we mixed the soil. I had arranged, I don't know how many buckets there were, maybe 50 buckets. And rather than take a backhoe and put the soil in the garden, which would take about five minutes, we lined up all 120 people from the parking lot to the beds and they passed soil for an hour and a half. And the kids all year would point to the spot where they dumped the soil from the buckets and say, that's mine, that's my spot, I did that. Because we had 120 people there, 120 people owned the garden that day. It was a very, very simple bed structure, but a heck of a lot of people made it. The principal, she was just circulating and talking to people, and there were people in the school bringing out coffee and sandwiches and donuts to the people who were working all morning. When we left, we had done this really incredible community thing. I realized later that summer that my deep-seated goal of wanting to disappear, not wanting to be seen as a foreman, came true. When somebody came up to me and said, did you see what they did here? And my interaction was, they? I mean, I initiated this whole thing. 
But she said, come here, I want to show you something. And she brought me over to this garden, which was in full bloom and was just extraordinary. She said, look what they did. And then she explained this whole process to me. There was this day and all these people came together in the community and they created this thing and it's amazing. And my child was the one that put that soil here. And I stood there talking to her and I realized that it's a community thing. It isn't identified as one person's project, which was really important to me. Everyone, everyone owned it. So here are some of Marsh's thoughts about what this story means and what this work meant. Towards the end of these interviews, we asked people to reflect on the meaning of these stories that they tell us. So Marsh says, I think, it, the guard, I think that this taught people that if we all work together toward a common vision, we can do something extraordinary. Something extraordinary in this case may not seem like much, just a little small school garden. But for a community of folks who were not feeling that they could achieve or maybe hadn't had success in a while, it was really a big deal. There's a whole benefit of the product, the amazing appearance of a garden and what it can do for people's souls. It looks extraordinary. Food comes out of it. There are educational things we can learn from it. We can celebrate it and have celebrations and events around it. Our children can reconnect with nature, see a butterfly, watch a bird. The benefits are also from participating in the process, what we learned about that, about each other, and about we all, how we all have a role. It brought support into the school and the community that wasn't there before, and expertise, and people, folks who were enthusiastic about the project. It was a catalyst through which other good things happened in the community as a direct result. So, I got like over a hundred of these stories from a lot of places. And this is a fluffy story. Marsha even says it, uses the word fluffy. This is a fluffy story in some ways, a nice story, a feel good story. But I keep getting these kind of stories from professors of agronomy in Kansas from people who are in the natural sciences, engineering, planning, landscape architecture. So I'm trying to think about what do we, what do we learn, what do we, what do we need to learn from a story like that? Alastair McIntyre says, we can only answer the question of what are we to do if we can answer that prior question of what story or stories do we find ourselves a part? So I'm thinking about Marsh's story and the various stories that she and I <laughs> might find ourselves apart, particularly as academic professionals in a college of agriculture, Cornell University's College of Agriculture to be specific, and College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, that's the title of my college. So there's one story this is the narrative stuff that I've been working with. Let's see if it's a part of that story. What's that story? That's the great, wonderful, heroic story of how land-grant colleges of agriculture created the world's most efficient agricultural system. Increased the productivity and efficiency of agriculture, improved the economic standing of, of folks in rural communities, simultaneously uh, creating cheap food for the nation's consumers, the nation's industries. In coming here, I, uh, one of the things I did was I read a few of the um, histories of Iowa State University. And that story is front and center in the, uh, there's a book by Earl D. Ross called The Land Grant Idea at Iowa State College, published in 1858 to, to mark the centennial of the institution. That story is very prominent in that book. And then there's a, a book by um, Ralph Bliss, who served as the director of extension here at Iowa State for 30 years. He wrote a book called History of Cooperative Ex Agricultural and Home Economic Extension in Iowa. It's to mark the first 50 years of extension in Iowa. And towards the end of that book, there's this glorious passage, and I'm not, I'm not, 
I really am not trying to be sarcastic about, about this. I live in upstate New York, and I can tell you people are desperately poor in many places in rural communities. Jobs and the economy is a big thing. It's important. It's not a trivial thing. But the story that Bliss tells at the end of that book, I'll just read a part of it. This is his, a big story that culminates in basically how we are to understand the value of cooperative extension. And Bliss was a complicated guy who understood different dimensions. But this begins, a remarkable increase in food production per farm worker took place in the United States from the past half century. This has been accomplished through a revolution in agricultural practices. In 1900, and this is familiar now, in 1900, 37.5% of the working population in the United States was producing food for 76 million people. Now about 11.6% of the total working population in the United States is producing food for 174 million people. And he goes on through the litany of technical and scientific progress and change, which culminates in an argument about how the extension education materials, demonstrations, and talks have been an important factor in increasing the productive efficiency of American farmers. Well, Marsh's story doesn't fit in that narrative. That's not a story that she's finding herself to be a part of. That's not a story we can fit in that narrative. So it's not that one. All right, so there's another story. This one's been told by Wendell Berry, who's not a, most people in the colleges of ag don't like Wendell Berry. He's been very critical of industrial agriculture. It's been told by, um, most recently by, uh, who wrote the book, The uh, Omnivore's Dilemma? Michael Pollan's most recent book, In Defense of Food, uh, uh, Jim Hightower's Hard Tomatoes, Hard Times. This is a story of, the, of land-grant colleges. This is a, the, the tragic counter-narrative narrative of oppression. This is the story that folks, actually some of them in the humanities, have constructed as they looked back at the history of these institutions and found a story of oppressing rural communities of destroying the environment. This is, I think of this as the tragic counter narrative of oppression and destruction, cultural destruction. The, the, the reign of technocracy, the experts making all the decisions, pushing ordinary folks out of the way, dictating to them how to grow, their, how to farm, how to raise their kids, how to eat. Think about cooperative extension. I love cooperative extension, but a lot of it is about, you know what, you're not farming right, you're not feeding your kids right. <laughs> You're not raising your kids right. You're not organizing your communities right. I mean, that's really what a lot of, uh, it was coming from a very well-meaning place. So there's this other tragic counter-narrative of oppression that people are telling about our, us and our institutions. This is one of the stories we find ourselves a part of that McIntyre talks about. I can't fit Marsha's story in that narrative. It doesn't fit in that narrative. It's gotta be another story. So what I have been doing in trying to make sense of stories like Marsh's is to be doing history, <laughs> trying to uh, you know, understand the complicated question of the relationship between higher education and communities and democracy. And I discovered Liberty Hyde Bailey, the founding dean of the New York State College of Agriculture, is one of my great heroes, and, and many men and women in the late 19th, early 20th century who came into these institutions deeply and passionately committed about, f committed to the integrity of rural communities, the, the potential and, and character of ordinary people, <laughs> how else do I say it, who found themselves a part of the story, two stories, the story for, the story of the pursuit of sustainability, which is a story that goes in the US culture, goes back into the early part of the 19th century. Stephen Stoll, a historian from Yale, has written a wonderful book called Larding the Lean Earth, which, which traces this really interesting development of uh, eth what he calls an ethic of permanence in the 19th century um, that was up against um, sort of a more, um, or less environmentally conscious sort of pioneer ethic of going into places and farming the heck out of land until it was no good anymore and then moving on to the next place. So folks like Liberty Hyde Bailey, a lot of men and women came into these institutions positioning themselves as 
characters in that story and in the story for basically the struggle for freedom and democracy and making democracy real. I can fit Marsha's story in that, that story. She fits there. But that's not a story that is very uh, prominently told <laughs> in my institution. We're spending most of our time in the sort of hard-nosed, um, tough issues about the economy, which is deeply important. Uh, or people are pushing, pushing the boundaries in biology, doing you know, cutting-edge work in genomics and, and, and other kinds of things, which you know, is amazing what people are doing. But I'm now, as I'm collecting all of these stories and thinking about their meaning, I'm thinking that one of our tasks in the challenge of sustaining the earth and, and raising the question of the arts and the sciences and uh, role in that and public scholarship is, is to figure out how to position ourselves as characters in that, those two stories that I find Marcia being a part of. This move um, that I'm suggesting, and I, you know, people are already doing it. It's not like I need to stand up and tell them they should. I mean, Marsha's doing it already. And she's not really naming it and talking about it in the direct way that I am, but she's, she's doing it. Um, there are some folks who, who would not approve of <laughs> moving academic professionals and institutions deeper and more closer into the work of making democracy real why? Because we're not supposed to be involved in politics, right? We're scholars. We're neutral and unbiased and objective and all of those kinds of things. And to be involved in politics is to destroy um, our, one of the things that, that's our public value, which is to produce knowledge and theory that people can trust. It isn't in somebody's pocket or something. And so recently, some of you may know about this, in terms of folks who would be doubtful about this move, which I think you're picking up when you pick up this conversation you are picking up the, the move of situating scholars in public life as participants with roles in democracy. Most recently, it's useful to have this kind of way out there provocation, I find. Uh, some of you may not have seen this yet. It's just come out. Stanley Fish has just re released a book with the wonderful title, Save the World in Your Own Time. People know who Stanley Fish is, was a dean of the College of Liberal Arts at University of Chicago, at University of Illinois at Chicago. He's been a provocateur um, of various sorts for a long time. Anyway, Dean uh, Fish writes this book called Save the World in Your Own Time, and you can guess from the title, what the basic point is he's arguing against the notion that higher education should be engaged in politics and in democracy in particular. And this is a complicated subject that has to do with the way teachers function in classrooms and things. So it's I'm not presenting it as a simple um, sort of straw man kind of thing. But, but one of the things that, that Fish says in the book is he argues that, this is a quote, we, and by we he means academic professionals, we are in the education business, not the democracy business. Democracy, we must remember, is a political, not an educational project. In answer to the question of what politics and democracy have to do with scholarship and teaching, Stanley Fish says absolutely nothing. If we were to agree with Fish, our conversation about sustaining the earth through public scholarship in the arts and humanities would be a pointless exercise, in my judgment. But not everybody agrees with Fish. And here I want to recall an important historical moment. It's something I've recently just discovered, and I've really been kind of amazed by it. And I'm frankly, thinking about it in terms of the context we're in right now of this presidential election. You know, full disclosure, I have an Obama thing on my lapel here. I'm on one of Obama's committees for his campaign. Um, the historical moment is the moment after World War II when President Truman created a commission, a presidential commission on higher education. This was a very, as we all know in higher ed, the post-World War II period. This was the explosion of of student population. So Truman, um, at that point, in 1946, he appointed this commission um, to, to ba and the letter that he wrote to the commission was basically saying something like, wow, this is a pretty interesting moment in world history. We should probably 
you know, and the, you know, the, the GI Bill had been passed already, so there was this vision already of colleges being flooded with, with new students. And so he, he appointed this commission of a bunch of men and women and said, you know, why don't you take a look at higher education? And what's interesting, the, the, their report was published in a book. Uh, the book was published in 1948 by Harper and Brothers. The book's title is Higher Education for American Democracy. So as I've discovered this, I'm, I'm interested in democracy. I'm like, wow, this is okay for American democracy. What are they saying in this book? And I'm thinking of this in relation to Stanley Fish. Well, you know, when we think about democracy, um, the connection between higher education and democracy, I think we most often are thinking about things like access, you know, providing open access uh, to students. So in this view, American higher education's American colleges and universities are understood to advance democracy by providing everybody rather than just a narrow elite with access to a college education. It's also commonly understood to be about the provision of liberal education to undergraduate students. That's supposed to help them to develop into their future roles as citizens. But while expanding and democratizing access and providing undergraduates with a liberal education are important, the connection between higher education and democracy is about a lot more than that. It's also about the public work of academic professionals, folks like Marsha who are out there engaged in communities. Whether Stanley Fish likes it or not, they're engaged in building democracy as an educational project. It's also a political project, but it is also an educational project. So this public work of academic professionals, through this work, through the roles and contributions that academic professionals play, and make in participants, as participants in civic life, there is some contribution to making democracy real. And what's I have found what I found really interesting is that President Truman's commission placed that at the center. They actually got that. They saw that. It wasn't just about, their report had tons of stuff about what are these colleges gonna do with this huge influx of students and a lot of stuff about that. But the very first volume of that report was all about this question of democracy. I wanna share some of that with you. In the commission's language, I'm gonna be quoting the commission here a little bit. According to the commission, education, this is a quote, education for a, for a fuller realization of democracy in every phase of living should be the principal goal of high American higher education in the post-war years. When they articulated this, this goal, uh, the commission embraced a very expansive participatory view of democracy. Democracy, they wrote, is much more than a set of political processes. It formulates and implements a philosophy of human relations. It is a way of life, this is John Dewey influencing them. It is a way of life, a way of thinking, feeling, and acting in regard to the associations of men and, men and of groups in their gender exclusive language, one with another. The commission called for the integration of democratic principles into the active life of the American people, noting that such an integration, quote, is not to be achieved merely by studying or discussing democracy, in its view, democracy, quote, must be lived to be thoroughly understood. It must become an established attitude and activity, not just a body of remote and abstract doctrine, a way for men to live and work harm harmoniously together, not just words in the textbook or, or a series of slogans. Far from being self-congratulatory, there was a sharp critical edge to the tone the commission used in discussing American democracy. It pointed to democracy's, quote, unfinished business and imperfections. Quote, the discrepancies between America's democratic creed and how Americans live are still many and serious. The commission declared society was plagued with inequalities, poverty, disease, and hunger. Freedom of conscience and expression was often denied to those who do not agree with the majority of the opinion of the moment. And while the commission noted that democracy, quote, sets up reason as the final arbiter of human relations, in the commission's view, the cold fact was, quote, that the appeal to emotion and prejudice is more common and office, often more effective among us than the appeal to reason. In striking passages on the connections between education and social responsibility in a democratic society, the commission found more unfinished business and more imperfections. All too often, it declared the benefits of education have been sought and used for personal and private profit to the neglect, to the neglect of public and social service. Yet individual freedom entails community responsibility. The democratic way of life can endure only as, a private, as private careers and social obligations are made to mesh. As personal ambition is reconciled with public responsibility, 
No group in American society, the Commission wrote, should, quote, pursue purely private ends that, and seek to promote its own welfare without the regard to without regard to, to the social consequences of its activities. Business, industry, labor, agriculture, medicine, law, engineering, education, all these modes of association call for the voluntary development of codes of conduct or the revision of such codes as already exist to harmonize the special interests of the group with the general welfare. Now, in laying all, all this out, the Commission did not assign all the blame for this situation on individuals and groups outside the academy. In fact, it placed a good deal of the blame on higher education itself. Today's college graduate may have gained technical or professional training in one field or another, it noted, but it is only incidentally, if at all, made ready for the perfor performing, again, the gender-exclusive language, his duties as a man, a parent, and a citizen. Too often he is, quote, educated in that he has acquired competence in some particular occupation, yet falls short of that human wholeness and civic conscience which the cooperative activities of citizenship require. So the Commission's critique of college graduates carried implications for the curriculum, namely that it should include more than just the technical, uh, technical training in the professions. It also had profound implications for higher education's social role beyond the campus, and this is language I really found striking in this Commission's report. They said, quote, the limited, conception that higher, the limited concept that higher education still holds of its role in a free and democratic society must be broadened. It must cease to be campus bound. It must take the university to the people, wherever they are to be found. Further, the commission proclaimed that higher education, quote, will not play its social role in American democracy and in international affairs successfully unless it assumes the responsibility for a program of adult education reaching far beyond the campus and the classroom. So as President Truman wrote in his letter setting up this commission, he wanted the re this re-examination of higher education America's higher education system to be conducted, in Truman's words, in light of the social role it has to play. Now the question <laughs> we asked today, and they were asking then, is what is that social role? Well, here's what, the, here's what the commission had to say about this. This is strong language from them. 1948 it was published. The first and most essential charge upon higher education is that at all its levels and in all its fields of specialization, it shall be the carrier of democratic values, ideals, and processes. This is the presidential commission. Its role in a democratic society is that of critic and leader as well as servant. There's the title of the my book I'm working on now. Its task is not merely to meet the demands of the present, but to alter those demands if necessary so as to keep them always suited to democratic ideals. Perhaps its most important role is to serve as an instrument of social transition, and its responsibilities are defined in terms of the kind of civilization, kind of civilization society hopes to build. If its adjustments to present needs are not to be mere fortuitous improvisations, those who formulate its policies and programs must have a vision of the nation and the world we want to give a sense of direction to their choices among alternatives. So at a critical moment in the history of the world, the Truman Commission on American Higher Education issued a call for academic institutions and professionals to find themselves a part of the story of the struggle for freedom, liberty, and democracy. At another crucial moment in the history of the world, namely today, Stanley Fish has issued a call for academic institutions and professionals to resist and reject such a move. If those of us who are scholars were to try to situ our, situate ourselves as actors in that story of the struggle for democracy, in Fish's view, as he argues, we would be, in his words, quote, guilty both of practicing without a license and defaulting on our professional responsibilities. I want to suggest that rather than being guilty of defaulting on our professional responsibilities, perhaps we would actually be guilty of trying to fulfill them. Political philosopher William Sullivan argues that there is a public pledge that professionals have historically made to deploy their technical expertise and judgment, not only skillfully, but for public regarding ends and in a public regarding way. Those who intend and manage to do this well stand in a tradition that Sullivan refers to as civic professionalism. 
With William Sullivan's conception of civic professionalism in mind, our conversation about sustaining the earth through a public scholarship in the arts and humanities becomes a conversation about a critically important question, namely the question of what it means and what it looks like for academic professionals to work for public regarding ends and in a public regarding way. Not in general, but in a democracy. In considering this question, something C. Wright Mills once wrote in, an, in his book, The Sociological Imagin Imagination, has really caught my attention. Mills is a, was a professor of sociology at Columbia University. He wrote in that book that the educational and political role of the social scientist in a democracy is to help to cultivate and sustain publics and individuals that are able to develop and to live with and to act upon adequate definitions of personal and social realities. I think Mills is offering us a compelling image here. And I'll be darned if I can't put Marsha Eames Shively right smack in the middle of that, even though she's not a social scientist. One of the things I've learned from thinking about these 100 plus stories is that this finding ourselves a part of this story in the academic world isn't limited to the social sciences. In fact, the people I find most passionately engaged in this are weed scientists. Folks like Don Weiss at the University of Minnesota, who's been a mentor and a friend of mine, who are, who are not asking anybody's permission to be involved, to see themselves as characters in that story. They're just doing it because they think that's what they're supposed to be doing as a public scientist at a public institution. I've laid out a lot of things here that reflect my own attempt to understand the situation we're in, the invitation to be engaged in public scholarship in every discipline and field, and to make sense of these wonderfully rich, interesting, complicated stories that, that scholars tell when they're actually provided an opportunity not simply to report their activities. I did this, 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 and this, and this number of people were there, but to actually tell their story of the experience and what it was like, what they learned and what they did. I want to close with a very romantic passage. I'm sorry, I'm a romantic in a whole bunch of ways. And this is a quote from one of Iowa's native sons, Henry A. Wallace, that fascinating, strange guy <laughs> who was president uh, Roosevelt's Secretary of Agriculture and Vice President, who himself ran for president. Was it 1948 that uh, Wallace ran for president? I just want to say this passage because the, it, it's moving to me as somebody who grew up in a small community in Illinois. But it, it's also provocative because it feels to me like we need the new articulation of this passage that fits the demographic and cultural diversity and change that I know you in, in Iowa are facing. So this is a passage that I couldn't help ha have come to mind to me when thinking about trying to interpret the meaning and significance of Marcia's story. So I think she falls right into this passage. So I'll just read it. This is in a book that uh, Wallace wrote in uh, 1934. The book is called New Frontiers. The keynote of the new frontier is cooperation, just as that of the old frontier was individualistic competition. The mechanism of progress of the new frontier is social invention, whereas that of the old frontier was mechanical invention and the competitive seizure of opportunities for wealth. Power and wealth were worshipped in the old days. Beauty and justice and joy of spirit must be worshipped in the new. Many of the most lively, intimate expressions of spirit spring from the joyous, continuous contact of human beings with a particular locality. They feel the age-long spirit of this valley or that hill, each with its tree and rocks and special tricks of weather as the seasons unfold in their endless charm. If life can be made secure in each community and if the rewards of the different communities are distributed justly, there will flower in every community not only those who attain joy and daily productive work well done, 
but also those who paint and sing and tell stories with a flavor peculiar to their own valley, well-loved hill or broad prairie. And so we think of cooperative communities not merely in a competent commercial sense, but also from the standpoint of people who are helping unfold each other's lives in terms of the physical locality and tradition of which they are a part. In this way, every community can become something distinctly precious in its own right. Children will not try to escape when they grow up. They will look ahead to the possibility of enriching the traditions of their ancestors. They will feel it as a privilege to learn to live with the soil and the neighbors of their fathers. Such communities will be strung like many colored beads on the thread of the nation, and the varied strings of beads will be the glory of the world. I think there's a truth in there somewhere. There's also some problems. <laughs> we have to figure out how to rewrite that paragraph. And I think the arts and humanities, scholars in the arts and humanities, are going to be a big part of helping us do that. Thanks a lot. Are there any arguments or questions? Do we get to take this? Yeah. No, you're definitely, you're raising the very, something we need to take seriously. I mean, I think as I, the reason, one of the reasons I like to work with narrative and stories is because when we do these, typically the, the, the rough edges aren't airbrushed out. So we, we can see the tensions and the dilemmas and the problems. Um, so that then we can talk about them. There's no question that, that if we don't reject Fish's argument, and we do decide, yes, we should be engaged in making democracy work and we should be engaged in politics, that there's a lot of things that we need to worry about in terms of the, what's the impact of that on our academic work and our scholarship. But for me, this is important because I think we really are in a time where we need to be raising the issue of our public purposes and work as a question that we seriously need to talk through and think about. But the perspective that Fish raises and, and some of the things you're talking about, that absolutely must be taken seriously. And we need a debate about this. We need a dialogue and a conversation about it. Um, and so I, you know, I'm eager for that. I, it's not happening at my institution. Uh, I, I think we need to figure out how do we talk about the, the worries we have um, about public engagement. Um, you know, I mean, we need to talk through all that, and we need to hear the different sides and perspectives. So, I think I understand sort of where you're coming from from that, and I, and I do think we couldn't leave that out of the story, because I, it isn't all just fabulous, wonderful stuff, and we should do this, and everything will be great. It's really difficult. It's really hard, and it's there's risks and worries and th serious dilemmas to work through. not on. There you oh, there, there we is. go. Uh, you moved me to, uh, to say something because um, I'm actually a passionate defender of the value of the land-grant ideal and the importance of education in democracy. 
Uh, but I also hired Stanley Fish at the University of Illinois you at did. Chicago. I did, yes. Oh. Okay. And uh, I'm also a great uh, admirer of Stanley's. And I, I wanted to interpret, because I know what Stanley was doing. First of all, he yeah. likes to provoke people. He yeah, likes to get... There's a value in that, too. He likes to get people... 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 He likes to like you to yeah. come back and say, yeah. no, no, <laughs> that's not true. But, but I also... Uh, his book was prompted by the attack on higher education by um, Hurwitz uh, that is going on. Um, the attack on the liberal establishment in higher education, um, which hopefully is starting to wane now. But in the height of the previous, uh, in, 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 you know, in the height of the um, most recent um, administration, um, there was a huge bashing of higher education that was going on. Uh, prompted by uh, this incessant um, drumbeat that higher, you know, that professors were all liberal. There were no there were no conservatives among professors, and therefore we were all bad. And liberal education was a bad thing. And so, yeah. what Stanley was trying to say was, um, the the biology professor who spends his or her time in the laboratory. Uh, doing molecular biological work is not doing politics, um, and that that's that should be. We 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 should cherish um, that aspect of what faculty do. We should cherish the fact that most faculty are not engaged in politics, and that should not be uh, their primary profession. Uh, so I see both sides. Yeah. Uh, and I That's see it very intently no. because I felt the wrath mm. of uh, Horowitz's wrath. No. So I, I, I understand exactly no. what um, Stanley Fish was trying to right. say. Yeah, so. it's, it's important to engage that part of it. And I, I, I think, you know, one of the things that, first of all, I'm t when I'm talking about politics, I'm using a small letter P, and I'm not talking about right. elections and, and governments. Right, but, I'm really but, talking about people and communities trying to figure out what are the problems we're facing and what should we do yeah. about it. And that's but, where I completely yeah. agree with you and where I think that higher education yeah. has to re-engage yeah. in public scholarship, right. has to right. re-engage in our communities, or we, we become irrelevant sure. to most of... But I, I, one of the things, one of the reasons why I like Liberty High Bailey as this historical figure that I've done a lot of research Quite on and studying, yeah. is, is that he was absolutely adamant that this notion that everything that higher education does should produce dollars and cents results immediately was, was absolutely, absolutely against <laughs> what higher education really stood for and was about. And so the, the sort of, this is part of the conversation we need to have with our publics you know, for an understanding of, of, of the, the, the public value of the work that's done and the different ways that that is making contributions to a culture and society in the incredible different ways. We need diversity in that area. So, so for me, I, I respect deeply the folks who, don't, who aren't engaged. It's an issue of everybody should be engaged in communities. It's more an issue, I think, in my response to Fish is the is sort of the extremeness at which he paints it. It's absolutist. It it makes it reminds me of much of the stuff Abraham Flexner wrote a book uh, called Universities, American, German, and English, in which he was voicing this thing that was familiar in the early 20th century, which basically said the only thing that should count as a university is something that that is only about training the next generation of scholars, and anything having to do with the professions is not supposed to yeah. be part of a university. So there's this very narrowing of the notion of what a university should be, and I hear that in Fish of this sort of dreaming of of that sort of exclusive narrow focus. And I think that what what while there's value in what he's saying, and I don't deny that, I think it misses the stuff we do see in the land grant of, of these wonderful folks that are doing things. So I think we need, the reason why I'm doing this narrative stuff is because I know I don't know much about what the heck they're doing and what's really valuable about it. And, and I think we need to be in a position of really trying to be open and learning. You know, what are we getting from this sort of work? And how does it complement the, the basic science that folks are doing, the, the archival work in history and, and other places?
I do have tenure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I do have a lot of these of, of people who are ten tenured who aren't scientists. But what, to me, the, the the issue is: can a story like this get our own imaginations going about us? You know. So I mean, and, and I think William Sullivan's point about civic professionals, about about exercising, basically, it's the, the issue of how are we going to bring our expertise into the public world. But that story it's isn't about. Yes, it is. That's a, I couldn't read the whole thing. Okay. But, but one of the things that's important about that whole story is what we end up seeing when we really absorb that kind of thing is this is what it looks like when somebody is trying to figure out how to bring their horticultural expertise into a community in a way that will also advance the project of democracy. So she's trying to figure out how to make her expertise be a resource while she's also committed as an educator to deliberately trying to be a part of the process of making democracy work. So what we learn, I think, there, that's one of the ways that someone like her, and she is an academic professor, but someone like her, and, and at my institution, they're very adamant about calling these people faculty. And you will be seriously regretful if you don't call people like her faculty. Because there's an attempt to sort of equalize, not just people who have tenure as faculty, but as people as faculty members who have extensions to their positions. Because they've been so second class in, in my institution. So for me, I, I look at her and I say, wow, that's one of the ways that someone like her is trying to uh, work for public regarding ends in public regarding ways. And for me, that, that has just helped me to begin to open an imagination about what that might look like. And I think it needs to be translated into other fields and, and other areas. And, and, and so to ask the question you're asking is, what does it mean for a scholar who has significant disciplinary expertise? There's still the issue of how do you work for public regarding ends in public regarding ways. And one of the ways you could do that without ever being embedded in the community. So for me, what's interesting, and, and that's what um, C. Wright Mills was talking about. He was talking about the classic public intellectual, the person who writes books that popular audiences read or gives lectures to popular audiences. That's different from someone who chooses to be engaged as a partner of community in a project. So uh, you're, you're right to point that out, and, and, and we can't just translate Marshall into that. We need stories from, from other places in the book to, to know how people are doing it there as well. Yeah, no, and my reference to tenure wasn't meant to separate yeah. the two yeah. things. I'm actually going to refer to the uh, yeah. benefit that I have that other people sure. don't, which is yeah. academic freedom. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and the story didn't seem to involve right. these aspects of our profession. Right. Okay, the second thing was, was the warning. I enjoyed your kind of like dramatic reading of the of the Reagan Reagan Presidential Commission report, but that's like that's so social unionism. Um, that's going to be a vision of all of society is like a big school yeah, filled yeah, with yeah. really enthusiastic students all the time. Yeah, and that's not going to be. Well, I'm not a Deweyan. I mean, yeah. I'm not. A, I'm not. And, and again, I, for me, it's more like the provocation because I think as I look around now, we need something to. to you know, something to help us figure out what is the role of American higher education in democracy. And the statement we would make today would not sound like that one, I hope. But, but it, there are actually parts of that that are really quite powerful and interesting. And I wasn't trying to do a close critical reading of it at all. But another question there? Where's the provost? I would like to hear your comment on um, what it would take for required public service or community service uh, to an undergraduate education would be a way to um, to obtain some of the values that you propose. I'm, I'm really skeptical about that. I, 
I think simply requiring things or mandating them is an indication of course people figuring out how to get out of it or how to pretend like they're doing it when they're not really doing it. So I'm not, I'm not real big. I, I don't think it by itself is mandating it. Is, I think it, it, it has to go much deeper than, than that. It has to be grown from the ground up. You know, one example for me, the commercial civic professionals and something I'm thinking a lot about in my work, and I have a colleague who is a tenured professor in landscape architecture. Again, those are fields of, those are professional fields, so this is really an academic discipline. But she um, successfully did this community process to get a requirement in landscape architecture for a course for undergraduates on community-based design. And the course is used as a service learning pedagogy. And the requirement is that students work with community to help them develop a real design for a real project. And what she's really trying to do is she's trying to help students understand the kind of professional they can become, their obligations, responsibilities, and opportunities of contributing something more than just their technical expertise. Or, as I think Marsha was doing in her story, bringing their tech technical expertise into the community um, in ways that don't smother people or doesn't end up being technocratic. I think those kinds of things are more promising when they're grown, but even her story has done a lot of, I did five interviews with her and wrote a piece about it. There's all kinds of resistance that the students have when they engage in this because they want the beautiful drawings for the portfolio. They don't want to be in some tough urban neighborhood working with bunch of people who don't have college education who are trying to figure out what they want to have in their neighborhood. So, I'm sorry to <laughs> go off on this. I think there's deep value in community service, and it is something really important, and people are doing it in amazing ways all around the country. And I'm, I'm friends with lots of folks who are doing that, but I'm, I'm wary of just mandating and requiring things. shouldn't be doing work study or uh -huh. trying to kick them out of a biology lab, out of a nuclear physics lab, and doing some kind of community service that is not going to develop them academically or professionally. So I ask you, how, in this age of uh, corporatism and globalization and all this competition and the pressures, um, the economic forces and the social forces that make the meaning of being a university student different than one of the things we have to do in that regard, and this is a basic teaching of community organizing, what we have to do is we have to start thinking about what are the potential sources of power that we can develop and exercise up against those pressures. And, you know, I, like I said, I'm a workplace organization, so I have a whole bunch of stuff, and, and 
I also believe in the power of the prophetic tradition. And, you know, Martin Luther King's in that tradition, Malcolm X is in that tradition, calling people and society back to the best of, you know, I think we have to be thinking, you know, what can we array against this? What are the forces of power? Um, and be figuring out how to exercise that. We also have to be politically smart <laughs> so that we don't get crushed and things we value don't get crushed. How do we do that? I think we need to learn how to organize. That's not something we typically, we're entrepreneurs, individual entrepreneurs in the academy. We don't, but we're gonna lose our grounded family if we don't know how to do that. So I don't know the answer, but I think it, it do, it's gonna have something to do with us figuring out what can we bring up against that? How do we stand up to it? And what, what do we have to bring up against Thank you for all coming and great questions and some great